When you're telling stories about food, a side of nostalgia is always a treat. In this episode of Lucky Chow, we visit several places where legacies of Asian American food and cooking are being preserved, but only so that they can evolve and thrive into the future. Whether it's taking on the leadership of a craft noodle company in Hawaii, or honoring mom's recipes at one of Brooklyn's hottest restaurants, preserving the heritage you grew up with is a way of preserving the taste of home or of a bygone era. I've been a fan of Sun Noodles for a decade since they first started making artisanal ramen noodles for chefs like David Chang at Momofuku and Ivan Orkin of Ivan's Ramen. In Honolulu, I got an insider's look at their Simon line, where they produce the soft wheat egg noodle used in Simon, the classic but slowly disappearing Hawaiian dish. When Hidehito Uki left Japan for Honolulu as a teenager on a risky mission to sell ramen noodles, he had never heard of Simon. It was quite a shock to discover that no one in Hawaii ate ramen, so he adjusted and manufactured the noodle that everyone around him was slurping. First stop is Simon Palace, where I met Hidehito and his son Kinshiro to discuss how the evolution of sun noodles is driven by a taste of nostalgia. So this is one of the original, original uh, Simon place. And uh, as far as the soup and uh, toppings and uh, noodles, mm -hmm. uh, they, they carry, uh, they carry uh, original style. OK. Put the shoyu and uh, with the mustard. Uh-huh. Pick up the noodles and a uh, little shoyu and mustard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just enjoy it, you know, when it's hot. And here in Simon, you have these teriyaki sticks, which uh -huh. is like a common Simon and Terry sticks. And you just eat it together, and you know, it's light, it's delicious, it's hot outside. This is the perfect sort of summer dish, you yeah. know, even though it's hot, it yeah. cools your body down. It's so refreshing. And I love the pork, the, the tasal pork in here. Yeah. Chashu pork. So you get a little bit of Chinese, some Japanese, some Portuguese. It's all in one melting pot, so. Which really is special. really the culture of Hawaii, right? right? Yeah. And it's just a, a place where a lot of immigrants have come and made it their home. And I think this is the perfect dish to sort of represent how all of these cultures, like the Japanese, yeah. the Chinese, as you said, the Portuguese, even. Yeah, Filipinos, yeah, just yes. everything. How did you come to Hawaii? Uh, we had an opportunity to start a noodle mm -hmm. uh, project. And the uh, project was uh, canceled, so there is one small machine. Uh, left at the Honolulu Harbor, so my father gave me opportunity to start a noodle business mm. if I am interested. Mm. So, so yeah, and I, I, I raised my hand. Yes, I wanna uh, try. But my grandpa also had a noodle business mm. in Japan, so that's where really he learned how to make noodles, and you know, it's within kind of the family. And so when he came out to Hawaii, it was really because he knew the knowledge of making noodles and right. coming to Hawaii and sharing that, so, yeah. So I'm just curious, you know, what's what's next for your company now? You have, you know, expanded into California and into New York. What's the, what's for the future? So uh, our goal is to educate or, you know, introduce a different type of uh, noodles, or well, we even educate the people in the U.S. to cre create their own, you know, uh -huh. uh, style. Like, he always say, if you go to uh, Texas, Texas is a famous uh, of uh, beef, right? Right. So they can use, they can create something with a beef soup, mm -hmm. you know, ramen. Uh, so that's the uh, culture we should uh, make in the future. I think that what you're doing is so wonderful because you're preserving the heritage of Hawaiian culture in this one little bowl. Growing up, my sister and I, you know, as a family business, um, 
We really grew up around the factory, the office, and you know, summer breaks were working in the factory, and when you got your driver's license, you were delivering noodles to restaurants, and so we're all kind of involved. And you know, when you see your parents um, just working 24/7, and you get to see that, you know, really in, in, in real time, you. Well, we develop a sense of just like appreciation and you know, for everything that they've given us. Right. And it wasn't really until I went to college, you know, and that's when I moved to Washington and saw my dad expand the business to California. And this dream just gets bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. And when I come home, it's always exciting because there's developments, but that's really when I said, I, you know, I told my mom I wanted to be a part of the company and I just join and help in whatever way I could. Mm. Um, and he, you know, my dad always mentions, you know, you speak English, you're born in Hawaii, you're American, and he's from Japan, but we have a beautiful craft that we have. How do you get it to many more people? I mean, how do you share this passion that he has with many more consumers in America um, and the U.S.? And right. That's probably been the number one goal for my sister and I is to share this love. Family business are special because everything at the dinner table, whether it's at home or 24-7, it's always about work. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's all against personal. Um, I think my family and my parents have done a fantastic job of educating my sister and I. Although we have a great business, it's all about the family. Yes. I never, I never forget that. We do have challenges as a family and as we grow. But the one thing that he's always mentioned to us is you know, noodles is what we do. But the real goal of, of him and the vision is create an organization where employees feel like Ohana, which is family feel you know, supported and successful and that we challenge them so that for us, if we can build an organization that you're proud to work mm-hmm. for, that's really what he wants us to continue in his legacy. So that's special for us and something that we respect. This place is called Palace Simon. And as the shirt says, they've been in business for 75 years. And as a family business, when we you know, get involved, it's, it's places like this that we need to be supportive of. And as long as they're successful and the community is successful, that makes the middle successful and it's really important that we support more of these shops to, to continue the legacy. Yeah, so Simon is not only disappearing in Hawaii, it's not even available on the mainland. Correct. And yeah. your goal is to make it as popular as ramen. <laughs> That's wonderful and I have no doubt that you will. When the ramen craze overtook America, Hirehito was able to realize his original dream. But as he and Kenshira look back at what Hawaii has given them, they want to preserve the Saimen culture of their adopted hometown for the sake of their own family, as well as their ohana, the community their business has created. In Brooklyn, where he was born and raised, James Beard nominated chef Calvin Ang as a rising star, and he's the first to admit that he owes much of his success to his mother, who taught him how to cook the home-style Cantonese-American foods he grew up with. He is now part of a new wave of Chinese-American cooks who are embracing their heritage and reimagining the dishes they grew up eating. His red-hot restaurant, Bonnie's, is named after his mom and is on the forefront of new modern Chinese cooking. Do you have a sense of what you guys want to make today? Yeah, I want to make the kind of stuff Saucy we had. Saucy fish with the pork. Saucy fish with the pork. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like hamu yuk bang. Yeah. Then a uh, hama toy. OK. And then steam egg, soft steam egg. The steam, steamed, steamed egg, egg. Custard, yummy. Yeah. These are like, that's inspired by something that's on your menu. Well, that inspired. No, definitely. Oh, Flat let's type. see if they have it. Oh, really? I remember I did R&D trying to replicate, not replicate, but like come up with a dish using hama, which yeah. is for the shrimp paste and cabbage, and like roasting it in the cast iron and then finishing in the oven, like tomato paste and everything. It was disgusting. <laughs> was Calvin always interested in, in food when he was a little kid? Yeah, he always stay next to me and then he put everything together. You know, he loved it. That's why he cook it, everything together. Make sure none are broken, you can't buy broken eggs. No, I mean, literally, your mother is my mother, and we, I've become that, and you will too. This is no, what you I, can- I do that. You yeah, so we, we all become our mothers. Bonnie on the QC patrol.
$32 for all this food, you cannot beat these markets. <laughs> We head back to Calvin's childhood home to get a glimpse of the mother-son dynamic at work, both in and out of the kitchen. Say thank you, Papa. So I didn't really grow up cooking Chinese food because like you, I had a mom who was so good at it, so I was always really intimidated by it. Did you grow up cooking alongside her? No, right, Ma? I feel like I always hung out in the kitchen and try to learn everything. But so you were really, really interested in it? Yeah, but I don't think I really started to document it and care so much until very recently, though. What kind of triggered your, your sort of newfound interest in the food you grew up with? I think, I think it was probably during the time when I was working in Chinatown and being surrounded by all the shops and restaurants that I used to go to growing up as a kid, and then finally wanting to dive deeper into the food of my culture and heritage. Calvin, did you grow up eating Chinese food every single day when you were growing up? Yeah, pretty much every single day. It was rice, it was Chinese food. Maybe like once a week, she would make something different, something special. <laughs> did you always know you wanted to be a chef? No, absolutely not. I feel like in high school, it was time to apply to a college. The culinary school just happened to be the only place I applied to. Really? Yeah. Like, I knew she wanted me to go to college and get a degree, but I never knew it was gonna be in culinary. And I feel like I had to lie and say that I was going to school for hospitality. Why did you feel like you had to tell your mother that you were studying hospitality and not actually cooking? Because I didn't think she would be proud of a kid who was going to college to become a chef. Yeah, because it's <laughs> an you know, the chef, right? And Chinese people, the old people, they don't make money. It's a hard job, it's hard in the kitchen. Not wrong about degree, any of that. Though. But not, <laughs> not now with Bonnie's, uh, you call it a Cantonese American restaurant. What does that mean? The flavors and ideas and the philosophy will always have to be Cantonese first, but the ideas and the technique and the ingredients that we use can kind of come from all over the world. And I was born and raised here in Brooklyn. I never was trained professionally in a Chinese kitchen. How I prepare things, how I do things will always probably be American, but I do understand Candy's flavors and the philosophy behind it all because of her. I mean, the mission of Bonnie's from day one was always to educate people on what Candy's food is and what it can be. How would you describe the, the, the flavor profile of Cantonese food versus, let's say, a Sichuan food or Shanghainese food? Yeah, I feel like I always say it's like savory and it will mommy forward and minimal ingredients allowing the main ingredients to shine and very seafood forward and heavy. You, you mentioned that you, you've never, prior to your first gigs in Chinatown, you've never really worked in a, a traditional Chinese kitchen before. No, that's why it's like the way we operate, the way we do things is probably very Western still. Yeah, we use a wall, do we use it properly? Who knows? I feel like I always tell people and always say that nostalgia is my favorite ingredient. And it's true because I always like food that takes you back to, to like a certain point or a certain memory in your life. I feel like from day one, the mission of Bonnie was always to educate people on what Candy's food is and what it can be. And that's a big part of us being part of like the evolution of Candy's food and doing things a little bit differently and doing them our way by being who we are, which is Cantonese American. Americanized Cantonese food, Americanized Chinese food exists for so long now in America, and that's a big part of American history, American Chinese food history. Where do you find your inspiration? Right here. Was mom very important in the R&D process? I definitely ran a lot of things by her. She probably had no idea what I was asking him for. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I definitely asked a lot of questions on like specific brands that she liked to use or things like that. And look how beautifully smooth that. So it's really like custard. Yeah, basically we want this to be as smooth as possible. So even like how she covers it specifically to prevent like um, the condensation from dripping onto it while it's right. cooking. Because you, when you pull it out, you want this gorgeous smooth surface. Yeah. Your version at the at Bonnie's is basically 
like this, except for the it's vinegar, this. which you learned today. Yeah. But it's um, this. But we put clams in it with so black beans. So the clams open up and it kind of are all set inside the custard. It all looks so beautiful. Calvin, what, what do we have on the table here? So this is the ham yuk ban, which is the steamed salted fish minced pork patty. And so kind of what we compared to like the American meatloaf. And this is the steamed savory egg custard that we finished with some soy, sesame oil, some herbs. And this is just a stir fried cabbage with the shrimp paste. Calvin, as you look ahead at Bonnie's, but also just your, your life in the culinary space. What are some of the things that you think about moving forward, things that you'd like to do in the future? Um, I think just mainly continuing the mission of what we want to do and educate people on Cantonese food and really driving that home in New York because, again, there are so many people who I am meeting now who are from the same backgrounds, who are in the same generation or even younger want to dive deeper into it as well and I think allowing them and creating a platform and a space for people like that to grow is super cool and important. Calvin's been cooking for many years. First restaurant of his own. Already so much attention, so much press. A James Beard nomination for best emerging chef. How do you feel about this? What are you feeling? I feel a power here. I'm so happy. <laughs> you feel proud of him? Mm, yeah. I'm so happy too. Oh. <laughs> Never told me that. <laughs> <laughs>
This is our tenpyeong che, which is our chilled mung bean salad. So the mung bean noodles we make in house, as and we prepare nine different vegetables and garnishes that go along with this. This is one of the most famous imperial court uh, dishes. What are the seven different techniques of of these vegetables? The seven different techniques on the vegetables are we use grilling, steaming, poaching, and blanching as well. But then what we do is we season them all on their own. And so each vegetable has their own special seasoning, whether it's a prilla, whether it's sesame, whether it's a scallion or ginger or ginger or garlic. We use different seasoning techniques so it converges into one sort of uh, seasoned dish. And it's really about the vegetables. The rice that we use is Queen Gold number three, which we source out of Korea. Wow, this is really elegant, like a like a mini masterpiece. Thank you. When you go to Korea, there's many different levels of food, whether it's street food, comfort food, or fine dining. And spice is just a small portion of that. At Has cooking here and sort of immersing yourself in this culture, what has that done for your own kind of personal identity, your identity as a chef? You know, it's nostalgic, right? Because it's flavors that you've had, you know, as a kid or growing up, but it's also, you know, new. Because this isn't your normal everyday Korean food, but it invokes a passion out of you that you don't never thought was there. I mean, you've had the passion for food, you've had the passion for cooking and everything, and you love the lifestyle, but this is different. It's very, uh, it's transcending to another level. On the shores of Waikiki lies the historic Halakulani, or house befitting heaven in Hawaiian. Since it makes celebrating Hawaiian culture a core tenet of its mission, we visit its beachside bar, House Without a Key, for sunset cocktails. We're seated under a 130-year-old Kiawe tree with views of the Pacific Ocean and Diamond Head. We meet Allison Chu, a former Miss Hawaii, to learn about hula dancing, which is performed every night, and meet chef Jaren Otake, who takes us out on a culinary tour of his creative interpretations of Hawaiian classics. It's a Japanese flair to a local favorite. So basically we have sashimi grade ahi. We, we cut into um, saku blocks, which is a, a square block, and then we sear it very fast and very high heat. And then we have a lot of tobiko to give it the contrast of flavors, um, textures, and then the tobiko brings out the freshness and it has some spice from the daikon, the freshness from the local ahi that we bring in as well. This is my interpretation of the lao lao. So lao lao is a very traditional Hawaiian dish. So basically it's slow cooked pork and fish mm -hmm. wrapped in a bundle with the luau leaf, which is the leaf of the taro. And it's wrapped again with a tea leaf. The lao lao always comes with a, a little piece of pork and a little piece of fish. So you have different textures and flavors. This is a, a very classic dish that we offer here at Halikulani, which is our steam snapper. Then we steam it with a little puree of ginger. We finish it off with some shiitake mushrooms. And then we splash it with some peanut oil and drizzle um, a soy sauce on top. We also have a little taste of our island flair with our desserts. So we have our lily koi key lime cheesecake. Lily koi is actually passion fruit. Uh -huh. So we blend it with a little twist with the, the sharpness of the acidity of the key lime and nice richness with the, the cheesecake and different textures and flavors. Very nice um, macadamia nut creme anglaise mm. to tie everything together. This is the, the famous coconut cake at Halikulani. We splash the cake with a little amaretto, and then we cover the cake with a shredded coconut. Plus we have a, a vanilla anglaise and the raspberry coolie to tie everything together. Wow. Hawaiian means to me is teaching people about the culture, giving back to the community, but more so it's food with soul, just to keep that legacy going of aloha, that, loving spirit and what we can do for our guests and for our families and teach our next generations to come, of course. Aloha. Aloha. Hula is all about telling a story. It's about perpetuating our culture. There's obviously a deeper meaning. So 
What do some of those motions mean? And maybe you could even show us if you. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a lot of kauna. So kauna in Hawaiian is a hidden meaning. For example, like this is could be flowers, and flowers symbolize a lot of things in Hawaiian. It could be talking about children, mm. um, um, or keiki, or even um, rain. Traditionally, people did hula in order to perpetuate thousands and thousands of years of storytelling, of chanting, um, describing legends and things that occurred in their families or on the islands. And now in modern day Hawaii, we're able to share that story or parts of that story of what happens in today's times and, and sharing it, it with our, um, our malihini or our, our guests and our um, visitors here. What are you hoping the audience walks away with? I hope that they would feel and understand through my movements and my own feelings of what I'm trying to portray and telling that story. Um, and then for, for them to enjoy this beautiful place. Hawaii is my home. There's really no place like it in the whole world. Looking backward, in order to see the way forward, a new generation is using the lessons of family and legacy to chart the evolution of Asian American food. In their hands, nostalgia is inspiration for the traditions that they will make their own 